Michael Meany is scientific director of the Ludmer Center for Neuroinformatics and Mental Health at the Douglas Mental Health University Institute. He is a James McGill professor in the departments of psychiatry and neurology and neurosurgery at McGill. He was one of the first researchers to describe how maternal care influences gene expression of the offspring, in particular, genes that regulate responses to stress. Meany is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a member of the Order of Canada, and a Knight of the Ordre National du Québec. So we've come to understand, I suppose, over the last 15 years or so, something that I think intuitively appealed to clinicians for many years, and that is that an individual's developmental history, and in particular, uh, the quality of their early family life, actually influences their health over the lifespan. Now, it's not too hard to understand how that's true for mental health. One can understand how parenting influences the risk for depression or for drug addiction. But it's actually as true for obesity, for diabetes, and for heart disease as it is for mental illness. So the question becomes then, how does family life alter biology so as to determine the vulnerability of people for these particular diseases? And what it suggests is that there's actually influences that occur during this period of time that somehow become embedded within the biology of the organism so as to influence the function of that individual over the lifespan and thus their health. We've been trying to understand how that happens. And what we've looked at, of course, in, in non-human species to start with, is simply the question of how is it that the variations that occur between a parent and an offspring can alter the activity of genes in the brain that regulate, for example, how you respond to stress. So we've looked at a rodent model, and within rats, believe it or not, there are very stable individual differences in the way mothers interact with their offspring. And we find that those interactions, the differences in the way the mothers interact with their offspring, actually alters the activity of genes in the brain that regulate the way in which that pup ultimately comes to respond to stress as an adult. So the question then becomes, well, how can the interactions between the mother and the pop stably alter the activity of genes? So the first question, of course, is to say, well, how do you go from a social event down to the level of the cell? But, you know, social events are like any environmental stimulus. They activate cells. And when they activate cells, they activate biochemical signals that operate within those cells, some of which directly influence the activity of genes. They interact physically with the DNA. So we asked ourselves, could it be that these persistent differences in the way the mother interacts with her pup stably alters these signals within cells and then actually starts to chemically modify the DNA so that it operates differently throughout the course of the lifespan? And those chemical modifications that occur to the DNA are what we call epigenetic mechanisms. And we provided evidence that, in fact, that's exactly the case, that these variations in maternal care literally modify the chemical environment in which the DNA operates. And because those chemical modifications have the ability to be stable, they can actually persistently influence the activity of genes, and in this particular case, the activity of genes that regulate stress responses. So we think we may have contributed to an understanding of how variations in parenting, for example, can stably alter those traits that then come to influence how uh, we respond to stress. And because our responses to stress are so influential with respect to our health, thus differences in vulnerability to particular diseases. Well, what we did actually, I suppose, uh, at about very much the same time was we launched um, a study looking at human children. So we, out of this institute in McGill, we direct um, a study called the Maternal Adversity, Vulnerability and Neurodevelopment Project, which studies continuously from mid-pregnancy onward the relationship between a mother and her offspring, human mothers and their offspring, trying to get at understanding as best we can in humans whether these processes operate and if so how under what conditions and what is the nature of the influence so i think we would all assume that human parenting does indeed function 
to influence uh, developmental outcomes and, and the health of the offspring. The question is, what are the consequences? Under what conditions does it operate? At what time of life does it operate? With respect to what developmental outcomes? And why are some kids much more vulnerable to the effects of parenting than others? So we started to try to basically mobilize what you would think of as a translational project that could bring the same type of questions but very much into a human context. One of the first things that we found that is, I think, probably very, very consistent with what you see in biology is that everything's probabilistic. That there are meaningful relationships between parenting at particular ages and the way children develop, but it's probabilistic. Um, it's not deterministic. There's nothing that parents are doing at any particular moment that is yes or no going to determine a particular outcome. They're biasing their children towards particular developmental trajectories. Well, Second is you find that there is in fact good reason to, to assume that some kids are more affected by parenting than others. And that in fact actually one of the factors that determines that is actually the genotype. Variation in genes renders individuals more or less sensitive to environmental influences. And that's an interesting feature because for many years we argued meaninglessly, I think, about whether personality or any particular trait was determined more by genetics or whether it was determined more by the environment. And it, determines, it, it turns out that these are absolutely interdependent influences. You can't really fully understand the influence of the environment unless you know the genotype of the, the genetics of the individual. Likewise, you can't really understand the relationship between genetic variation and development unless you understand the environmental context within which that development occurs. And I think that's what's really been most rewarding is to conceptually be able to really start to understand how it is that the genetic makeup of the individual operates differently under different environmental contexts. Well, it's just, it's a false argument. And, and I think actually the very best quote I ever heard was from an old professor at McGill, Donald Hebb. He, Hebb was asked by a journalist what contributes more to the contribution, what contributes more to individual differences in personality, nature or nurture? And he argued that's like, our, like asking what contributes more to the area of a rectangle, the length or the width. And I think that's absolutely the perfect metaphor. Um, that there is no nurture without nature and there is no nature without nurture. They're entirely interdependent at every single point in time. So to try to disentangle them is meaningless. Rather, what you want to do is to understand how nurture operates within the context of the nature of that individual. That is, how environment influences the individual depending on their genetic makeup. And then secondly, you need to understand nature, that is the genetics and the influence of genetic variation in terms of the environment in which that individual operates. Because um, I think coming from the standpoint of biology, believe it or not, even working with the simplest species, plants, insects, you come to appreciate that the one common force that determines individual differences in specific traits is our signals coming from the mother. Every species on the planet has at least a mother. Um, some have two parents, but at least they have a mother. And you can study uh, within these very simple species, including even plants, these maternal influences. Now, they're obviously not mediated by the same processes that occur within humans. But it's a question of signals. And if you think about it, the mother or the parent is heavily invested in the success of their offspring. So who better to signal these individual differences in development? So it made sense from the standpoint of biology, but it clearly also makes standpoint from the health research component as well. Because what you come to understand, of course, is again that the family is the context that is so important in driving health outcomes. That's even true if you step back from it and say, well, clearly the family operates within a broader context. You know, socioeconomic forces, of course, are huge determinants of individual differences in health outcomes. 
But when you look at the way the socioeconomic or poverty, for example, influences health during the course of early childhood, it's by operating through the family. So what happens, of course, is that poverty compromises the, the function of the family, and that is what influences, ultimately, the development of the child. So I think it was the realization, both from the standpoint of very basic research in biology, as well as research in the health sciences, that says, hold it, I, th I think this is where we want to look. I, th I don't think anybody is going to be terribly shocked to understand that family circumstances influence the health and capacity of children who grow up within those families. I think at the same time there's an enormous latitude there. We become trapped into thinking that there are ideal families, that there are ideal children, and ergo there must be ideal forms of parenting. And I think that we know isn't true. I mean, if we look historically, or even if we simply survey the world right now, we find that families exist in many different configurations. And we find that children obviously differ considerably, and that children who function perfectly well and in good health can be a very different makeup. Um, but there is, I think, obviously an appreciation that there has to be an investment, right? And you know, so for example, working on the issue of parenting, I'm often asked, well, are you blaming the individual parent, and particularly the mother? And it isn't a question of blame. I think it's important to understand that parents are themselves, and their behavior towards their children are subject to broader forces. We see that these days in the extension of the work week, the way in which the economics of our country and others impinge on the ability of parents to interact with their children. So this isn't a question of blame, but I think it is a question of understanding that the family unit really is the major defining force in determining the health and development of the child. And then perhaps stepping back and looking not universally at the way I'm interacting with my children per se, but in the way in which my whole family is actually functioning as a unit. And how does that operate with respect to the function of each of the members, including the children themselves? And then I suppose the second is, is the notion that if we are to appreciate that parenting is subject to broader forces, then it leads us to consider and concern ourselves with the mental health of the parents themselves. And so I think there is perhaps reason to, to sit back and say, for any particular parent is to sit and think about how your own health and your own stressors ultimately influence that of the child. Now that obviously leads in some ways to just making your own stressors even worse, right? Because now not only do I have to concern myself with my own health, but I now have to think about how they're influencing my child. But I think that's something we need to take into consideration. I think it's Again, we're going into very broad considerations here. It's a question of priorities. I think that there are lots of times and lots of families we work with who, when you think about it and when you bring them to the point of considering the health of their family, start to wonder whether or not you know, they really need the materialistic gain that is associated with so much investment in the workforce. Um, but I, you know, these, are, these are questions. And, and they're for individual families to respond to. There is no right answer. Um, it's a question of what works under the appropriate circumstances. I, I think there is, it is time both from the standpoint of parents interacting with their children, but it's also time for parents and families to interact with each other on a broader level as well. And I think now we're moving away from advice we give to families and perhaps more towards advice we give to people in public policy. Um, we constrain family life to the detriment of the next generation. If I had advice to give, it's the same advice I was given. Um, focus on the question. <laughs> 
What do you want to ask? Don't get too caught up in technology or trends. Um, just find a question that means everything to you as an individual and then find the very best research approaches to answering that question. But it's all about the question.